as a global security company providing weaponry to national governments, including the United States Department of Defense. Lockheed Martin is the largest overseas supplier for the Israeli armaments industry, and since 1995, it has received more than four billion from Israel for providing arms such as fighter jets and missile systems. One of his contracts with Israel includes manufacturing F-16 fighter aircrafts for the Israel Defense Forces and is financed in part through the U.S. military. In March 2010, amid criticisms of Israel's continued housing destruction in the occupied territories, the United States and Lockheed Martin signed a new agreement to provide Israel with several new Super Hercules tactical transport aircrafts and a $2.7 billion deal. Israel has purchased 20 new F-35 fighter jets from Lockheed Martin who delivered between 2015 and 2017. Europe's investments in the four companies listed from the occupation and system of apartheid by providing the finances that manufacture weapons and weapon components that are used to kill and maim Palestinian civilians, provide materials supporting and economically developing the illegal Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank, thereby entrenching the occupation of Palestinian land, and also perpetuate Israel's siege of Gaza and its discriminatory practices and policies against Palestinians, both in the occupied Palestinian territories and within Israel. Europe is bound by the same principles of international laws all other organizations and people are bound to. Europe's investments in the four companies violate several international laws. This further supports why Europe has both a legal and ethical obligation to immediately divest from the four companies. Um, so these are some of the laws that are listed. I'm not going to go into all of them, but uh, just to go into one of them. The uh, European principle illustrates the violation on part of Europe in violating international law. Uh, principles 1 and 2 emphasize that individuals and organizations are responsible for complying with principles of international law. Furthermore, Principle 7 states that complicity in the commission of a crime against peace, a war crime, or a crime against humanity is a crime under international law. And it and is a legal obligation not to invest in companies or organizations that may be complicit in the commission of these crimes. Europe's investments in the four companies are a violation of the Nuremberg Principles, thus rendering it potentially complicit in war crimes under international law. By investing, by investing in these firms, in spite of their actions, Europe not only violates its stated ethical principles, but becomes complicit in the breaches of international law and violations of human rights. Given its mandate to establish the university's policy governing its investments, the Governing Council has the authority and obligation to ensure that these investments comply with ethical and legal standards. So based on our findings, we have the following demands that we are bringing towards York University. Uh, the, first, the first is that York University immediately divest and refuse to reinvest in BAE Systems, Northrop Grumman, Hewlett Packard, and Lockheed Martin. Second, that York University refrain from investing all companies involved in violations of international law. With respect to Palestine, this entails following the guidelines put forth by Students for Justice in Palestine and the historic divestment by Hampshire College. And lastly, York to work with students and faculty and staff to undergo a democratic and transparent process to ensure accountability to principles of social and environmental justice. Part of a global movement for divestment, um, there are uh, ambassadors that have come before that have helped guide us and um, shape our divestment campaign. Um, from the early stages of this campaign, um, Carleton, Univers Carleton's, Carleton University's divestment campaign is used as a loose model. Carleton, as many of you know, launched their campaign last year. They are currently working to solicit support from campus groups, faculty, and student unions, preparing to submit their report to the decision and policy makers at their university. We have learned much from their experiences and are excited about joining in what will be a national campus divestment movement, joining in a growing international divestment movement. Um, and 
Of course, we probably would not be here if it weren't for the hard-fought anti-apartheid campaigns that ended the apartheid apparatus of South Africa 20 years ago. We have been working on the campaign very closely with Faculty for Palestine, members of which have been able to share their experience of working in the South Africa anti-apartheid movement. Apartheid was made famous by South Africa's racist regime, but is recognized by the UN as a generalized crime with universal definition. The South African apartheid state and the resistance movements that fought against its racist oppression for years set a historic precedent for Israel, Palestine, and the Solidarity Movement. It is important to note, though, that it is the strength of the Palestinian people in their struggle for sovereignty, dignity, and self-determination that will ultimately bring an end to the colonial occupation and apartheid policies that are taking place. Exclusion, exploitation, and harassment are their daily realities. But the resistance movement continues to fight Israel's war crimes and continues to build around the world in solidarity with Palestinian civil society. Um, and of course, for all of us to join the boycott investments and sanctions campaign. So just to reiterate, um, these multinational corporations are complicit in war crimes, not just in Palestine, but in other illegal colonial wars carried out by Western powers. They have been involved in horrendous violations of human rights in Palestine, including the murder and collective punishment of thousands of innocent civilians, and they continue to violate their indigenous populations right as we speak. We have no doubt that once administrators who make the financial decisions for this institution are aware of the atrocities that these companies have and are committing, they will do the right thing and divest. And just again to um, discuss South Africa and New York's um, divestment from South African apartheid, um, we will, well, York was the second Canadian university to adopt a policy of divestment from South Africa. York divested between eight to nine billion dollars from all South Africa linked companies within its pension holdings. Because of this, less than four years after Europe took a firm stand against apartheid, the South African regime began to unravel. First with the re release of Nelson Mandela in 1990, and then with the country's first multiracial elections in 1994. In becoming the second Canadian university to implement divestment against South Africa, York set an example for universities across the country that would eventually take a stance in support of social justice and human rights. We hope that York will repeat this and, and be on the right side of history again and be one of the first universities to divest from Israeli apartheid. is a network of about 450 academics from across Canada who organizes primarily to help build uh, the BDS movement from within Canadian universities and colleges, uh, as well as to fight for freedom of expression on Canadian campuses around Palestine, uh, Palestinian solidarity and Israeli apartheid, a fight that goes on, obviously, uh, as we speak. Um, and so the reason that I'm here speaking tonight is to say a little bit about some of the work uh, on the divestment campaign that we in Faculty for Palestine have been doing with our student allies in the Toronto Science over the past little while. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about the very strong and widespread support that the Saya divestment petition has already received from faculty within Canada and internationally. Uh, but before I get to that, I just want to make a very special point of saying what an enriching experience it's been to work with mem members of SIA over the last little bit. 
Uh, in addition to being amazing organizers with seemingly endless insight and energy, uh, in my experience, these are some of the most warmest, most welcoming, and supportive folks I've actually 